Well, the Prime Minister is pushing states and territories to lift caps on international arrivals and allow stranded Australians home. Meanwhile, the inquiry into Victoria's botched quarantine scheme has heard private security guards were the wrong cohort to be used in the doomed hotel program. Joining me now is Sky News host of Credlin and News Corp columnist Peter Credlin. Good to see you tonight, Peter. Uh, let's, um, well, let's go to Victoria first. I was going to go to Queensland, but let's go to Victoria first. Now, we know that uh, Brett Sutton, in many respects, has been sidelined in any decision-making as a result of what's happened with the hotel quarantine stuff. But we also now know that the Defence Force unequivocally, we've seen that evidence in the last 24 hours, they unequivocally said to the Victorian government, you guys can have who you need, when you need it. And of course, the Premier, Daniel Andrews, has maintained all the way through and is even maintaining today that that wasn't the case. I mean, I mean what do you have to do to convince this bloke that he got it wrong? Well, well convince him not to lie. Let's be honest, that's what it is. I mean, let's go back to the start. Victorian health officials, before the first hotel opened, uh, wrote to their counterparts and said, we really think we need uniforms. We need police. We need uh, military uniforms if required. The military uniforms were offered. They were offered to everybody. The Prime Minister made that clear uh, multiple times. He said it publicly in press conferences. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Fruin, in evidence in a, a Canberra parliamentary committee, uh, said that that offer was made. We've got the Defence Minister say that offer was made. Uh, and we are now have this evidence from the head of Prime Minister and Cabinet to the head of Premier, Victorian Premier and Cabinet, to the two chief bureaucrats in both jurisdictions, confirming in writing about the offer of ADF personnel. And the only person in that whole uh, sorry circumstance is the Premier, who fronts this interminable hour-long press conference every day, where he's getting questions but not actually answering them, uh, to state that, no, that's not my recollection, that's not true. Now, come on. Victorians are only growing angrier, at least by the minute, and the obfuscation and the, you know, the half-truths and mistruths, as I call them, the lies, let's be really honest about it. If he was in Parliament and said those things, you could sack him for misleading the Parliament. But you confront a press conference every day and mislead Victorians and mislead the media, and there doesn't seem to be any consequence until, if and until, he fronts an election in two and a bit years' time. Mm -hmm. Now, you won't be going on any country picnics in the next few weeks because the fine for that is nearly $5,000, which is I fair know. enough because it's, in, it's important that that doesn't happen. But last night, Peter, I spoke at length to uh, a whole range of politicians about the way in which uh, the bush, the regions, uh, country Australia, country Victoria has been uh, treated in this particular pandemic. This one-size-fits-all blanket policy that Andrews has implemented has really, really hurt, bitten so hard in, in, in uh, regional parts of Victoria. It's actually criminal. I just can't understand that it's happened. It's got to have... Look, look, to be fair, a policy like this has to be flexible and it has to have regional nuance. Uh, Daniel Andrews' view is that there's, there's Melbourne and that the country is just the country, as if the whole of Victoria is exactly the same. Now, my mum lives just outside of uh, Geelong, that's very different than where I grew up in the Mallee. I mean, COVID cases in Geelong were high, virtually none non-existent in the Mallee. So you can't just apply a whole of New South Wales view or a whole of Queensland view outside your capital cities either. Now, early on in the pandemic, I have to say, and, and most of my family live in regional Victoria, they didn't want anyone from Melbourne coming near them, right? We saw floods of Melburnians try and get out to their second homes or rent Airbnbs and avoid the restrictions. So quite rightly, I think that there had to be a, a line between Melbourne and country Victoria mm. to protect country Victorians. But now that we're getting the things, on, uh, the, you know, it all under control, and we can see what's happening in New South Wales is a good example of what's right, is that so much of country Victoria re relies on the movement of city people to go in and out for work, to go away for weekends and generate tourism income, and for, quite rightly, people in the country areas to be able to go to their capital cities, you know, for entertainment or for work or for, you know, any other reason. So, so all the way along, month by month, politicians should have been revising these plans and not have them like they are in Victoria as set and forget. There's no easing of restrictions in Victoria in any meaningful way for Melburnians until the end of October, and that's just the curfew really going up, and really no great change until November. What happens to the spring racing carnival? 
all the country cups that make mm. a huge amount of money, f you know, for country communities. We've got cricket, that's gone. AFL, well, we won't have the Boxing Day test as we know. The AFL, well, it's up at the Gabba. Uh, you know, what happens for, for New Year's Eve and, and Christmas? I mean, I've got no hope right now. Honestly, no hope that I'll even get to mum at Christmas time, all because the bloke running Victoria is utterly incompetent. Mm. Let's switch to Queensland now. The Palaszczuk government has uh, been found out. Uh, $580,000 it's paid consultants, one of which is Mike Kaiser, the former state director of the Labor Party, basically for polling to establish whether or not the electorate was uh, uh, agreeing with their strategy around COVID. Now, this comes off the back of this massive, massive advertising campaign that are also being derived through taxpayer dollars. Uh, Peter, I've never seen anything like it. I reckon, and I said this today on 2GB, I actually think Vladimir Putin would be looking at Queensland right now saying, that's the model I need. That's the model I need. So I have said from day one, I don't know how many times I've said it on here, I've certainly said it on my show and I've put it in my columns, uh, she is the most uh, puppeteer, poll-driven politician that I have seen anywhere in this country and I'll even go back historically I've never seen anything like it right she's just a, a cardboard cutout that they roll out and, and all their henchmen sort of you know move the cords behind her Jackie Trad was one of those Mike Kaiser I can't understand actually how a former Labor political apparatchik you know a Labor Party chief in Queensland is allowed to get a taxpayer funded job inside a department so close to an election. It stinks to high heaven. It shouldn't have passed the probity test. I mean, Peter Credlin, right at the edge of a, a you know, federal election, couldn't get a job in prime minister and cabinet, might get it in a political office, not in prime minister and cabinet. That wouldn't be right and it wouldn't be seemly, but you know, there's no rules in Queensland, obviously. But this is political polling. This is a saving of about $600,000 to the Labor Party. And they will use and mine and, and pull apart exactly. everything they learn uh, to run the next six weeks going into the campaign. Through the skies of Brisbane, they were running these sort of strong leader uh, signs off the back of planes to counter ones that were negative against her the other day, paid for by individuals. But, I mean, they were Labor Party paid signs, but what was uh, informing mm. the lines and what was said and I think what informs everything she says when she opens her mouth it's all driven by the polling that the poor old taxpayers had to pay for. Unbelievable. Well, one bloke who is putting his hand in his kick, Peter, is Clive Palmer, who's not short of a quid. Uh, he's spending a fortune. And, of course, today there were big ads uh, in the Career Mail and there will continue to be big ads over coming weeks and months uh, because uh, Clive Palmer has made it very clear that he thinks Anastasia Palaszczuk should go. Now, he's been accused of bullying today. Kevin Rudd came out on Twitter and said Palmer needs to, uh, you know, close his mouth. He needs to reassess what he's doing. Uh, these ads, they were potent, but I'll tell you what, uh, a lot of people agree with them because a lot of people are thinking exactly what these ads said. Well, let's be very clear. One of the lines in the ad said, this is above the Premier's head, if she doesn't make the decisions, she shouldn't be in the position. Now, the Premier herself said again and again and again with a back to the wall on Friday after pretty horrific circumstances with a young girl trying to get to her dad's funeral. She says, I don't make the decisions, I don't make the decisions. And I thought, God, if I was the LNP, you know, political strategist, I'd be cutting that up, putting it on a loop and running it as an ad every single day until the election because you think, well, hang on, if we elect you to make decisions and not making them, we're not going to be stupid and elect you again. We want you to make the decisions. So if you're not doing them, move on, sister. But, but the issue I hear is I don't find these ads particularly tough. I find them truthful. And the cheek, I mean, Kevin runs a bloke that threw his dinner at a RAF steward up in, you know, 35,000 feet one time when he was Prime Minister because he didn't like what they were serving him. Uh, he's a guy that threw, you know, <laughs> books and papers at his staff. Um, you remember all of those uh, colleagues that hit the airways yeah. in the February before he was rolled and, and justified why they did what they did? I mean, the bloke... A bloke almost had a dictionary of foul language written after he left office to call anyone a bully Kevin Rudd, even Kevin Rudd, you know, Mark II with a, with a grotty beard. Come on, please, we don't buy that. <laughs> Great to see you tonight, Peter. We've run out of time. Great to be here. See you, Glaser. See you later.